Thank you everyone for joining CareerSearch today for this very important webinar. Cisher is a very common disease process and it is estimated that approximately 10% of the population in the United States will experience a seizure during their lifetime. Today you will learn how you can improve patient outcomes and be at your best when you're offering seizure treatment. treatment sorry. I am your host for the webinar, Paula, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters for this webinar, Dr. Gil Salazar, Virginia Smith, and Dr. Sarah Shapen. Dr. Salazar is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at UT Southwestern. He serves as the Medical Director of EMS Education and oversees both initial and continuing education of area EMS professionals. He practices clinically at Parkland Hospital Emergency Department. He is dually board certified in Emergency Medicine and EMS and serves as core faculty for the Emergency Medicine Residency at the EMS Fellowship Programs of UT Southwestern Medical Center. He is a creator of campus emergency preparedness and survival training, and his main goal is to improve the quality of education in the management of natural and human-made disasters. Virginia Smith was licensed paramedic for Cypress Creek EMS in Spring, Texas, which utilizes aggressive emergency protocols. She was working at the in-charge paramedic position in ambulance teams responding to 911 calls. She received her bachelor's in biology from Texas A&M and her master's in biomedical sciences from University of the Internet War School of Osteopathic Medicine. Virginia has been accepted to medical school and will start August 2021. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Shaver. She's a second year resident in the UT Southwestern Emergency Medicine, Residence, Medicine Residency Program. She has a special interest in medical education as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion in medicine. She's originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and still loves to cheer for her Georgia Bulldogs. In her free time, you can find her exploring local parks and taco joints. All right, so just so you know, we have included the slides from today's webinar as a handout that you can download. And then we will be taking questions throughout this session, and so be sure to share those in the webinar chat. They can be answered either after the slide we're discussing or at the end of this presentation. And now, Dr. Salazar and team, I will take you from here. Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you everybody for attending this afternoon. Hopefully you're enjoying some lunch or you would uh, already enjoy your lunch. I'm really grateful to my panelists uh, today and to Career Cert for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you. Um, as always, our mission at UT Southwestern Medical Center and Career Cert is to bring you innovative material, uh, cutting edge medicine that is truly bound to change uh, the management of out-of-hospital uh, cases. With me today, I'm very pleased to have uh, Virginia Smith, who's uh, been uh, one of my, my right-hand folks for, for a while as part of these uh, webinars and this series. So very delighted to have Virginia today. She'll be starting medical school pretty, pretty soon after a, a pretty awesome uh, paramedic career. And with me as well as Dr. Sarah Shaver, whom I uh, think very highly of, um, has an interest in EMS and very graciously agreed to spend a little bit of time with us uh, this afternoon. Um, couple of, one brief announcement before we get started into the case. Number one, I urge um, all of you on the call today, um, our numbers for COVID-19 are surging uh, again and uh, we owe it to our EMS professionals out there to have the best possible uh, education, the best chance to stay healthy so that we can continue to provide high level care to the patients we serve. So please take care of yourselves. Um, let's uh, put medicine first and foremost and the science first and foremost and how we manage uh, this pandemic. And so thank you for indulging me for a second or two. Take care of yourselves. The case today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, kind of beyond seizure, although the description has it kind of very, very uh, seizure oriented. Um, if you've spent some time with us before, you know that uh, the cases we bring you are not always uh, very clear cut. And so this case uh, is going to kind of walk you through a seizure uh, that also involves a little bit of bloody airway. And uh, we will actually teach you one of the... Uh, the most uh, scary syndromes out there that's actually responsible for everything you're going to see today. So we're going to walk you through some aspects of the patient's exam through the scene and the management of this seizure and this airway that hopefully will help you tie everything together toward the end. And Dr. Shaver is going to walk us through as well. And Virginia is going to provide her uh, EMS perspective. So, uh, Virginia, let's uh, take it away with the initial presentation, and then I'll do the uh, the scene management. Absolutely. 
Um, so in this patient, you respond to an unresponsive female in a public place, a shopping center. Um, of course, when you walk up, everyone's crowded around the patient. You can't really tell what's going on because there's so many bystanders. Um, and they're trying to assist the patient, which is, which is awesome. You have two paramedics, that's your crew. And there's nothing around you that you see as dangerous, except for maybe all these bystanders, but it's clear, it's open. Um, you're approaching it and figuring out how are you gonna deal with this patient. Much like um, Virginia alluded to, this is one of my least favorite um, such of scenarios. Uh, three weeks ago, I was first on scene responding with the fire department. I was in my um, in my vehicle and I responded. I was first on scene and when I arrived, um, there were no less uh, than 15 individuals who looked upset. Uh, PD was already on scene and, and thankfully they had everything under control and directed me to the patient. But when I saw all those folks kind of standing around looking upset, that is my least favorite type of uh, kind of my least favorite welcome. So let's uh, get started. This uh, 28 year old patient who um, was found at the shopping center uh, began seizing approximately 12 to 15 minutes prior to EMS um, arrival. Um, we have documented that the patient was unresponsive. The medics noted she had some uh, kind of motor twitching activity um, on one side of the mouth only. They noticed there was some um, blood in and around uh, the mouth, some on, on the floor. Um, there was some pooling around it. A well-meaning bystander had actually placed her on, uh, on her side. Um, apparently somebody had put a, what looked like a popsicle stick uh, or something along those lines uh, in her mouth trying to try to help out. Um, they noticed no actual seizure activity and for the purposes of this webinar, I'm gonna call it tonic-clonic activity, the actual motor, very heavy motor component to it that was not present at the time of arrival. The medics documented a soft uh, blood pressure. The patient was uh, tachycardic. A respiratory rate of six was um, was documented. The patient's temperature was unremarkable. And uh, really what kind of stuck out to me was an SpO2 of 80, 83% and um, an entitled CO2 of 54. And if you've never spent any time with me or these webinars, you know that uh, entitled CO2 is, should be considered a part of vital signs going forward for um, high functioning EMS agencies. Uh, the medics says part of their protocols uh, went ahead and got a blood glucose, a point of care blood glucose, which was 97% uh, than normal. And uh, kind of the survey that was documented in the uh, EPCR shows that the patient was was thin. Uh, they documented uh, the gap ETLS, there was no trauma, no hematomas to the head. Um, when they did a brief airway assessment, they noted a uh, of uh, some tongue abrasions, not really a, a laceration, kind of hard to tell. They called it uh, a cut within the EPCR. So for the purposes of the webinar, we'll call them um, tongue abrasions, perhaps a laceration. Um, you know, let's go ahead and launch the poll, uh, Paula. And um, really what I want you to kind of start um, telling us is, how do you proceed? You got a, a complex scene here with a lot of bystanders, um, some, very, very basic care being provided. You got a patient with an entitled CO2 of 54, a SpO2 of 83, and bradypneic, which is uh, a low respiratory rate. Um, you're still on scene, so where do you go from here? Do you try to RSI the patient right there as best as you can, given the amount of, um, of uh, hypoxia that you're seeing? Uh, do you move your patient to the back of the box and, um, and provide airway control right there? Um, does your protocol have you insert a king or any other extraglottic, supraglottic airway uh, right off uh, right off the bat? Do you start with uh, some benzos or even even redose it um, after starting an IV or intranasal? Tell me kind of briefly where where you want to go and start and start letting us know what you what you think. Uh, part of scene management and scene safety for me um, here are, we're going to be discussing it with, with Virginia. So let's see what our attendees today are saying, uh, Paula. Looks like um, 
really the majority of you, almost 50% want to get that king in um, in right away. And, and that's actually not a, a bad call at all. I'm not sure that there is a, a, a really bad answer here. Okay. Especially in this situation, there's there's a lot of bystanders. There, You're not exactly in control of everything around. PD might be on scene yet or might not. If, if they aren't, absolutely call them and get that help. Um, but I, I think it's totally appropriate, especially in this scene, to kind of get the patient to a more controlled environment where you can actually work without all these distractions and just these variables that you can't really control. And um, the very first thing you need to address, though, here is their airway. ABCs, A's first, right there. Obviously, respiration rate is slow. Oxygen is low. Um, you have to look at that blood. They might need some suction right away, um, depending on how much it is. And so before you start thinking of all the fancy drugs, all the fancy procedures, you just need to do airway first. Um, use your people and, and get that on very quickly with high flow oxygen and make sure that those vitals are responding appropriately. So Virginia, then, it sounds like uh, you go to um, want to start some airway interventions, mm -hmm. gonna, um, ASAP. Um, Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about how you, you're the paramedic in charge. How do you delegate? What do you delegate to your medic? You may be working with an EMT at that point, not a paramedic. How do you, how do you work that in such a complex scene? I think it definitely depends on the situation. With this situation, it sounds pretty chaotic. Um, and thankfully, I've had an awesome partner that is an EMT, but she can thoroughly handle anything BLS with um, really out my prompting. But if, if I need a prompter, that's OK as well. And so I would give her kind of, OK, do this oxygen, manage airway, suction, take care of these things while I start looking around and start to the next step. If I'm working with someone new, um, then I might have to do that if, they, if they're if they having trouble figuring that out, which is totally fine as well. But it is really helpful to have an awesome partner that can handle all these things without, without a lot of help from me, for sure. I gotcha. Do you start bagging uh, this patient, given the, uh, with some bloody around, gonna do you suction first? How do you have your EMT play I that? would suction first, um, and then do a quick reassessment um see if it's still like the oxygen's immediately changed if it hasn't then yes i, I would buy okay sounds good well let's see what uh what the uh, medics wind up doing uh, virginia and we're going to walk through through the actions and sure enough uh, we did quite a bit of bls first and that is always the the most acceptable way to go, especially in such a chaotic scene, is go ahead and get uh, BLS done first. So the me medics went ahead and suctioned um, the patient. They actually went ahead and put an OPA uh, on this patient, given um, the fact there probably was an upper airway obstruction with the blood, maybe a tongue in the way, the fact that she was seizing, and they did start uh, some BVM ventilations. Now, um, just to let you know, the uh, American Heart Association, we're working with them on an airway algorithm. And one of the things that's going to be coming out is that, you know, we've used the word BVM for a very long time. And actually, we're going to be moving to um, bag mask uh, ventilation instead of bag valve mask uh, ventilation. So it's going to be BMV going forward. That's for another webinar. I just wanted to let you know, uh, the medics went ahead and gave uh, intranasal midazolam, or uh, the uh, train name is Versed, as part of their, their protocol and perfectly adequate for a normal sized, uh, sized adult. Um, the medics did report um, upon QI that the patient's mouth continued to bleed despite uh, suctioning. Maybe that OPA also contributed a little bit, hard to say, uh, but definitely continued to bleed. Uh, unfortunately, the SpO2 remain in the, in the high 80s despite everything that uh, they were doing, and the entitled CO2 dropped just uh, a little bit, but remained in in the 50s. So uh, now we got we control the scene. Now we've started some BLS on the patient, a little bit of paramedic level work, uh, but we're still not making uh, any progress. So Dr. Shaver, walk us through through what the uh, the medics went ahead and did. Yeah, so thanks, Dr. Salazar. So the medics, they got him in, got the patient into the ambulance, get into a little bit more controlled situation, able to take a second to say, reassess the situation. So it's a, a 
for the most part, unresponsive woman. There's concern for continued ongoing seizure. There's blood in the airway, a persistent hypoxia. We're looking at we're going to have to intubate this patient or some, get some kind of secure airway for her. So what are they when you're kind of looking and assessing at what the intubation was going to be like it, the blood in the airway makes you start to think maybe this could be a difficult airway so the team kind of took their difficult airway algorithm they attempted video laryngoscopy twice without being able to successfully intubate because that blood in the airway they attempted a direct laryngoscopy as well still unable to get that airway so the team opted to put in an extra glottic airway and so, Virginia, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the difficult airway algorithm y'all use. Absolutely. Um, well, with, with any intubation, um, there's people want the most experienced provider to do the intubation, but of course, if no one else learns. And so, what I've seen most common, um, if someone is, is learning, but they're very capable, they'll, they'll try first with a supervisor who has um, done lots of these um, difficult airways that can always take over, right there helping them. Um, usually the, the first provider tries twice, um, the first attempt, and then they come up with, okay, what went wrong? And then they go the second attempt, of course, with um, BVM in between. And then if they fail the second attempt, the supervisor takes over. I've never seen the supervisor take over and, and miss. It's always been three intubation, on a third intubation attempt, we've always made it. Um, however, according to our protocols, if we miss that third, we would go to a superglottic airway, which is a king or an IGEL. Um, and if that, according to our protocols, fails, then we would go to a BVM with adjuncts. And if that fails, which again, I've never seen, that would be an immediate grike. Um, and so, yes, I think it's, it's good that there's, it's very laid out. Okay, what, so we're not trying something that's obviously not working and getting tunnel vision, um, but those are our protocols. Excellent. I think in the in the emergency department, we follow kind of a similar algorithm when looking at our uh, our difficult airways, which this one definitely kind of makes you pause when you think about the blood going on and the, the active movement in the mouth and the low oxygen starting out. So with that superglottic airway in place, the SpO2 remained in the low 90s, end tidal was in the high 40s, there continued to be some blood around the oropharynx um, and then in the nose. So they decided to head on over to the emergency department what um you know i'm looking back on this case um i wonder what um i i think really part of what made this airway rather difficult one was maybe perhaps the patient was still seizing um despite paralysis might still be clenching a little bit i guarantee you the blood in the airway continued to to be uh, a problem uh, I think doing some QI on this type of case, uh, proper positioning for for the patient um, could have been could have been improved. But uh, once, when you have three three attempts in Virginia, it sounds like as part of your your protocol, you get really kind of an algorithm where you have uh, one or two attempts, and then you punt it off to the most experienced uh, medic mm -hmm. on the crew, or maybe a, a supervisor coming in but uh yeah this this is the uh, the kind of stuff that gives me the heebie-jeebies despite everything that you're doing and all the protocols and in training sometimes uh we have some very difficult airways so the medics did the right thing on this one followed protocols to the t and um kept um backing the patient through through the king uh, as best as they could and got the patient in so let's uh let's see what was happening in the uh, emergency department sarah yeah, so the emergency department, we had a little bit of a heads up. We got a call about this young woman, concerned for some seizure-like activity, found down. She was going to be, um, she had that super glottic airway in place because of difficult intubation, and they were going to be in the emergency department. So we gathered our team of physicians, nurses, RTs, and kind of prepared for what we were anticipating to be, a difficult airway. Um, so when the patient came in, you know, we were still, we were satting in the low 90s, not ideal, but we did have an ability to oxygenate the patient. So we had a little bit of time to really prepare for a successful intubation. So kind of like what Dr. Salazar was saying, getting the patient positioned appropriately, getting them fully pre-oxygenated um, to the highest that we can get for about two to three, maybe even five minutes if you have time. Um, and then we attempted to intubate this patient. 
we used a video a video laryngoscopy um, but with a direct blade so that we could take a good look but had a little bit of a backup with the video if we needed it um, the team successfully intubated the patient secured that uh, that airway and then we're able to focus on managing the status that she was still in one of the um, the words that's in that's in here that uh, perhaps some of our friends on the call today may not be familiar with is the term delayed sequence intubation. Um, and Dr. Shaver, we want to clarify a little bit for, for folks what that is. Traditionally, rapid sequence intubation is different from delayed sequence intubation and in that delayed sequence intubation, uh, it takes quite a bit of extra time coordination to go ahead and pre-medicate the patient, pre-oxygenate aggressively, you don't move a finger until you are happy with the sustained SP, SpO2. Um, now, this one was a bit of a kind of a, a more delayed sequence intubation in that it wasn't traditional. The patient already had an airway in place, and what we were doing is uh, pre-oxygenating the patient as best as we possibly could using the existing uh, supraglottic airway before uh, proceeding with the laryngoscopy. And uh, Dr. Shaver, tell us a little bit about um, kind of your your preference when it comes to video, because we're calling it direct here, but it was kind of a, a video with a direct blade. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So yeah, it's a little, it's a kind of a fun hybrid that we're able to use in the department. So what what we bring is it's the traditional video laryngoscope, the traditional laryngoscope shape. So like a typical uh, like Mac 3 that you're going to intubate with. So you can direct, but then this scope also has a uh, a, a camera on it that's attached to the video. So it kind of it's advantageous in a couple of different ways. So as a learner, you're able to use the scope and get a direct view of the cords. Um, but you also have this video that kind of serves multi-purpose. It can be a backup, so your attending behind you or your supervisor behind you can also see what's going on. And it also gives you kind of an advantage of if you can't get that quite that view with the direct, then you also have the video that might give you a little bit of a different view. Um, so a lot of times we'll go for that where we can still practice that direct laryngoscopy skill, but also have the video backup if it turns out to be a difficult airway. Um, and kind of it allows you to also be able to troubleshoot with those that are in the room. So it's a pretty cool resource that we're able to use. Yeah, that's outstanding that the blade behaves like a direct, like a normal old school uh, laryngoscope, but then you have the video aspect to it. It's outstanding. Uh, Sarah, tell us a little bit about your, um, the strategy for this patient. Uh, looks like we went with pretty heavy benzos uh, at first. Was that dosed kind of in boluses or an infusion later? Or um, how did you how did you play? And then we did a little bit of propofol as well. Sure. So go to for the benzos. We'll go ahead and hit them with four of Ativan, and then we'll even redose it, especially for this patient that already got five of midazolam in the field. We We'll give them another dose, another chance of benzos, and then if they continue to fail, we'll go ahead and put them on propofol, which we know is an anti-epileptic as well. Um, so that's usually the progression that, that we'll see. We'll also load them with an anti-epileptic if they're in the emergency department and their seizure's not breaking with the benzodiazepine. Um, so something like Keppra or Levitrazotam is something we'll also reach for while we're trying to break this patient's status epilepticus. Thank you so much. And uh, Ativan is uh, lorazepam. Uh, probably would have been okay to also use uh, midazolam. Um, would have been uh, good as well. Probably would have put the patient on an infusion. And for some of you uh, who work on flight services and kind of long transport and infusions with benzos is a good way to go. So now we have this patient whose um, airways under control are seizure is um, going to be managed as aggressively as we possibly can. And uh, let's go back to the last one there. Let's talk a little bit about the differential um, diagnosis for, for this patient. So for, for seizures, for altered mental status like this, we're going to consider uh, like the big categories, for example, endocrine. In endocrine, we have diabetic emergencies like DK. You can also consider thyroid disorders in the differential. You have trauma which includes intracranial hemorrhage, 
uh, or head bleeds. This could be hemorrhagic shock, uh, for example. We have uh, other emergencies specifically for women, uh, eclampsia, for example. That's something to be uh, considering in a, a menstrual history is very important in patients such as this if we can get it especially from bystanders we also got to consider uh, neurological emergencies such as uh, stroke uh, along the same lines a an infectious neurological emergency such as meningitis is uh, is something that can pop up uh, also remember that um, uh, in terms of medications toxicology overdoses intoxication with medications perhaps they're not illicit illegal drugs they can be a patient's regular medications can cause altered mental status in seizures even overdose of seizure medications can cause seizures as crazy as that as that sounds and last but not least remember at the basic level your cardiopulmonary emergencies that can cause things like seizure anything that can cause low oxygen low perfusion in our brain can um, can do something uh, like this, including hypoxia, and especially for our uh, EMT um, partners, hypoxia would be would be just fine. Um, let's go ahead and uh, and move on to uh, the next slide, and that's going to be Dr. Shaver. Yeah. So for in the emergency department, the patient got a pretty extensive workup. Here's some of the pertinent findings. The we got a CT scan. You can look at the CT. You're taking a look kind of at a cross section of the brain. We're looking for things like Dr. Salazar was saying, like intracranial hemorrhage. Um, and for this patient, we don't see any kind of blood. The read on the CT scan was maybe not normal, but nothing to explain the current situation. Um, and then we also got some labs. So when we're looking at the labs, the pertinent things that stuck out to us, the hemoglobin was nine, so a little bit low, um, particularly to a prior that was 10.6. The platelets were 12, which is profoundly low. Uh, creatinine 1.21, so up a little bit. And then a glucose of 452, which is high, but probably doesn't explain exactly what's going on in this patient. Um, hey, Dr. Shaver, there's a lot of things coming at you with, with all these numbers, with all these um, lab results and, and glucose that's now off. How do you organize all this in such a critical patient? Absolutely. So I think the first thing I do is I want to start ruling things out from the differential that we looked at. I think the CT scan was really helpful in that. And then the next thing is kind of putting the labs together and figuring out if there's some kind of syndrome, some kind of disease, um, some kind of pathologic process that's going to put these all together. So for this patient in particular, um, the low platelets is what really stands out. And then the hemoglobin also being low stands out. Um, so when we kind of put this together, I think there's something using up the platelets. Why are the platelets so low? Um, so for this patient, we had, um, they had thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura. So what is that? So uh, we can skip to, yeah, they're perfect. So this is, this is a disease most commonly acquired, sometimes inherited, although that's rare, and it's a deficiency in an enzyme called Adams TS13. And so really that enzyme kind of lives in our, our coagulation pathway. And what it does is it'll, it chops up one of our other factors called one von Willebrand factor. This factor, its job is to help the platelets clump. So when we're leaving it instead of its small clumps that the platelets will usually form, when the Adams TS13 doesn't work, it causes large von Willebrand factor to still exist and large, large abnormal platelet clumps can happen in the blood vessels. So this disease kind of sits in a larger category of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which when you break it down, it basically means that something in the vessels is causing the red blood cells to break apart or hemolyze. So this, if you kind of put it together in your brain, the abnormal clots within the blood vessels are kind of live in the blood vessels and cause shearing of the red blood cells when they pass through the clots. So when you start to think about the presentation of this disease, it's it's pretty vague. Like uh, it's got some fatigue, maybe some bruising, and then you can get some headaches, confusion, and then to more severe situations like seizures, stroke, uh, coma can all occur with this disease. And so there's a lot of different pieces, but if you can remember the pentad or the five things um, that we commonly see in this disease, it kind of helps put it together in your brain of, of what we're seeing and why we're seeing it. 
So number one, the platelets are low. Our patient's platelets were 12, which means they're getting used up somewhere. They're being used up in these abnormal clots in the blood vessels. Number two, there's anemia. So with these clots in the blood vessels, the red blood cells are being sheared, destroyed, and they can no longer carry blood or carry the oxygen to our tissues. Number three, we get neurologic changes. So this is because of the small clots that can happen in the microvasculature of our brain. Um, so you can start to see things like seizure, seizure and stroke because the blood's not being able to get to where it needs to go. We can see e increased temperatures because this is an autoimmune disease. It's our body is fighting against itself, particularly um, the Adams TS13 enzyme. And then we also see kidney failure because remember our kidneys have the similar microvasculature that's really susceptible and needs a lot of oxygen. So there can be small um, clots that happen in our kidneys and they also are having to deal with the breakdown of the hemoglobin when they're being sheared. So when you put it together, it's, it's basically blood clots because the platelets are being used in a weird way and then altering the way we're able to get blood to the rest of the body. So that's kind of how I break down this disease in my head. And so what is happening? For... Oh, oh, excuse me one second, Virginia. I apologize. Uh, I'm uh, when I explain this concept to early level learners in uh, EMT and paramedic school, mostly at paramedic school. One of the best ways I can really put it is uh, as a result of this uh, abnormal clumping due to the lack of this Adams um, Adams uh, 13 you have less circulating amounts of platelets floating around in your blood vessels, leading to an inability to clot correctly. And this is also an immunologic process that also leads to kind of those red blood cells breaking breaking down. Uh, these RBCs, those red blood cells break, and those blood vessels become really sick um, as well. So you have both less circulating volumes of platelets to help us clot you have also less circulating volumes of healthy red blood cells and so when i try to think about really what these these things are causing it makes a lot of sense yeah platelets are low for sure um the patient is going to be anemic with low red blood cell counts this can also one of the hallmarks is going to be this neurological deficit and that neurological deficit can be anything like seizure stroke-like symptoms confusion altered mental status optimization on responsiveness etc fever and then last but not least kidney failure so yes some of these are very difficult to assess by a medic in the field but you can definitely uh, see signs of low platelets in patients like easy bruising uh, you can definitely see signs of anemia in patients with a, a skin pallor, for example, uh, neurological. This is exactly the same deal here. The patient may have been febrile at the time they got to the hospital and they were bleeding. So, yeah, she's checking uh, a couple of marks. Go ahead, Virginia. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I was just wondering what was happening with the glucose. It's now 452, which is really high. It, it wasn't that before. So that's a great question. And I think the answer to that probably is the body is under a lot of stress. And so releasing glucose to try and keep up with everything that's going on, especially with the she seizure she's having as well. So that's how that one kind of fit in my mind with the picture of what's happening. Let's take a, a question right here. Um, one of the wonderful questions that we just received is, um, sounds like the patient at various points uh, during their presentation out of hospital um, had low SpO2 and high in tidal CO2. And so the question was, was the patient postictal uh, after seizing or actively seizing? And so it, it, it appears to me that the patient was hypoventilating um, and hypoxic as a result of more than likely an upper airway obstruction. So they are dropping their SpO2 and they're also hypoventilating and those entitled CO2 levels are going up. Uh, one of the things that we also see in patients who are seizing their lactate levels can, uh, can also uh, go up. Uh, they can become acidotic in helping explain a lot of the entitled CO2 findings that you have. So that's a really wonderful question. If you really want to make it basic for yourself in a patient who is breathing poorly, ventilating poorly, low SpO2 and high entitled CO2, they're hypoventilating uh, until proven otherwise. 
And uh, another question that just came in, we're actually going to address it here uh, shortly. It uh, it uh, talks about uh, alternatives, uh, alternative medications by EMS for seizures. So great question. We're we're going to get to it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now that we kind of have an idea of this TTP and what it is, the next kind of course of treatment, particularly in the emergency department, is what are we going to do? How are we going to fix it? How are we going to stop it? So like we talked about, the, the disease is autoimmune, which means there's an antibody. There's The body is producing um, these antibodies that are attacking itself, so autoimmune. Um, so what do we do for that is we do what's called a plasma exchange. So what we'll, we do is we hook the patient up to a machine that will take some venous blood and separate it into some components. So it separates the plasma from the rest of the blood. And within the plasma, they're the antibodies against that Adams TS13 enzyme that's causing all the problems. So we take away the plasma and the antibody. We give the person back the rest of their blood and also oftentimes donor plasma which then is replacing the, the plasma back in the blood with good plasma without the antibody within it. Um, so we're kind of trying to fix the problem, take away that offending agent that's causing the Adams TS13 enzyme not to work. Um, what, if we don't have access to plasma exchange immediately, there are some, some temporizing um, things we can do. We oftentimes will start the patient on immunosuppressants like steroids, and then also there can be a role for plasma transfusion. So to kind of temporize a patient, we'll give them plasma that has a functioning enzyme. But this, like we kind of we're talking about, we still have that antibody there, so it's still causing a problem. So we'll only temporize the situation if we give plasma back. So really, the treatment for these patients is going to get plasma exchange and kind of turn down the production of that antibody. Uh, and then Virginia, I guess kind of when you're thinking about this case, what are some of the considerations for, for y'all in the EMS setting? Absolutely. Um, well, especially with this patient, their hemorrhage in the mouth proved to be very difficult in maintaining the airway and causing obstruction and dropping that SpO2, raising that CO2. Um, so we absolutely have to watch that um, frequent suction and this made the intubation really difficult. And so intubation strategies for a difficult airway. Um, and it obviously like they they had a hard time with this and it so sounds like they went through the right protocol for that difficult intubation strategy. But, um, and then we also have to watch the altered mental status. We consider other causes for this altered mental status. We consider actions that we can't predict or control with this patient with the altered mental status. We see that a lot with post patients. Um, and so we're watching all these things that might possibly happen and kind of prepare for them in case they do happen. You know, one of um, one of the questions that uh, I get when I'm presenting this uh, condition, this syndrome, this very scary syndrome to uh, my EMS colleagues is, you know, doc, can we really, how can we make this, this diagnosis? Uh, is there anything we can do uh, to kind of, uh, kind of push the boundaries of, of the diagnosis and really the reality what I want you to remember is that in in EMS in medicine overall you're going to have kind of bits and pieces of information and sometimes it's really really hard to put them all together so you're going to have a patient who's seizing a patient who is bleeding a patient who's febrile with a fever a patient who uh, may have bruising somewhere and um, it's it's really hard even for for the most experienced of medics to put things together. So what I want you to do when you're thinking about EMS considerations is that it's perfectly okay to handle each problem at a time. I would just urge you to always keep pushing the boundaries of your own education and think to yourself one day if you see something like this, it's like wow, I learned uh, a while back. This patient has a neurological uh, symptom uh, right here. The patient is has some really abnormal. Uh, bleeding and I want you to consider these scary syndromes in your differential and why because uh, not every facility has the capability to do plasma exchange this needs to be uh, carefully coordinated with specialists of the blood with hematologists uh, and the equipment to do this type of uh, we'll call it for kind of simplistic um, purposes we'll call it kind of dialysis um, a little bit 
the second thing to remember when it comes to EMS, remember that this patient's mouth was bleeding uh, quite a bit, probably because she had low platelets. Um, but remember that the bleeding can happen anywhere in the body. So if she had, got, had gotten a, a small a bump by a car um, on her liver, she could have an intra-abdominal hemorrhage. If she had fallen during her seizure and hit her head, she could be bleeding from there. So I urge you to, as you're putting these things together, consider kind of the other places that can get this patient um, in trouble. So let's, uh, let's discuss um, kind of how to manage seizures, especially when you're having uh, trouble with them. Now go ahead and take it away, Virginia. Um, so this patient was having a thing called status epilepticus um, or status up, which is continuous seizures for over five minutes or two or more discrete seizures within a five minute period where they're not coming back to their cognitive baseline. Um, and so we have to manage this. Sometimes when there's a seizure and it's just a very short seizure and they come out of it on their own, you don't have to give them this medication, but this patient had this status up and so you, you do have to manage it with medication. In the ER, the first line would be benzos, which is the same in EMS, um, midazolam and diazepam. You do have to watch the blood pressure, make sure they're not hypotensive. In the ER, the second line would be um, Keppra or Valproic acid or, um, I don't know how to, I haven't heard it pronounced. How do you pronounce this, Dr. Salazar? <laughs> Phosphenitoin. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, and then if that still isn't managing the status up, you would go to propofol, ketamine, phenobarbital, and lecosamide. Um, for EMS, obviously we don't have all these medications in our tool toolbox. We do a lot of times have ketamine, and we tend to go for that for an RSI for these types of patients. Um, and then, as always, ABCs, airway protection, make sure that blood is not obstructing the airway, make sure there's not vomit, make sure that you're suctioning and continuing to manage that. Um, and then seizure precautions, um, as always with, with seizures, make sure they're not falling off of something, wash their head, um, and then watch out for that postictal possibly as well. And then EEG monitoring in, in the ER. Um, I think this is where we could talk about the different options for EMS um, for medications. Is that right, Dr. Salazar? Yeah, you know, this is, um, as we prepare to, I want to have a little frank discussion about ketamine and, and benzos for status epilepticus. While we're getting ready for this, um, we've been uh, taking some live questions toward the end of the presentation. So if you want to ask a question live, Go ahead and put it in the chat. Let Paula know that you want to ask a, a question live and uh, toward the end. Uh, if we pick your question, we can unmute you and we can have a, a little conversation live. So please do take advantage of that. We want to engage you a little bit more. So um, the number one thing that I want to make sure um, our audience, our medics and instructors, educators out there, take a look at is that status epilepticus can go under-recognized because sometimes we think that seizures are strictly we associate them with this tonic-clonic, very heavily motor-oriented um, type of a seizure. But uh, this patient had some, all she had was some mouth twitching, was unresponsive. That's a seizure until proven otherwise. And sometimes we also don't uh, remember that, uh, you know, these prolonged seizures uh, lasting greater than five minutes, or the patient may actually have a window in which they're not seizing, uh, but they kind of go back to it. If the patient has been ceasing for five minutes continuous, or they have two or more of these kind of distinct episodes without uh, returning to baseline, that patient has status epilepticus. So the patient uh, here, it wasn't just a simple seizure at a mall. This was status epilepticus with TTP. This patient was pretty freaking sick. Um, definitely agree uh, with the medics in this situation of giving the, uh, the benzos right off the bat. And um, doing it intranasal is a good way to go while well, we establish uh, uh, an IV, definitely intramuscular as well, fully support intranasal. I like that a lot. So, Virginia, when it comes to, to the ketamine, uh, pretty much every service that I'm, I've ever worked with and that I know around the country um, has ketamine readily available. So, let me ask you this. Is ketamine a reasonable first-line therapy for somebody in status epilepticus who 
also needs an airway. What um, do you think? I've, I've always started with the benzos, um, and then we've kind of moved toward ketamine as we're also moving toward the airway. I, I mean, if they're really hypotensive, then then maybe that might be a strategy, but I've always started first line benzos and then second line ketamine and moving toward airway control. I gotcha. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be a little more cavalier, a little more, uh, a little more aggressive. I'm going to kind of put it out there for you. Uh, if you're very comfortable with, with ketamine, you have a patient in clear status epilepticos, especially if you've, um, uh, given one dose of benzo, you say your protocol has you, the standards generally five, max 10. Let's say you've given five, the patient is still in status epileptic as you know you're gonna need an airway. I would actually push uh, that ketamine and start getting the patient ready for, for an airway and start pre-oxygenation. So I just think that ketamine is so versatile, um, so easy to dose uh, and so incredibly dynamic in its in its effects, rapid onset. That uh, I think it would be a very reasonable and sort of instead of having to move to uh, the second five milligrams of uh, of the midazolam of the verse said, I might actually go for for the ketamine. So I'm not telling you to not do what your medical director asks you to do. I just urge you to kind of think of different ways of managing these very, very sick airways, especially in a patient who is is hypoxic with an entitled CO2. Um, and so, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Sarah. I, interrupt you. I think there's, there's one thing that I think with these status epilepticus patients that I kind of also harp on and try to focus on is once you get the, the airway uh, used, I'm thinking of the word, once you get an airway and you've intubated the patient, you've pushed a paralytic, you want to make sure that they might still be seizing. So go ahead and getting a medication on board afterwards, because especially with these status patients, if if it's hard to see, like you're talking about these non-convulsive status patients, or if it's a convulsive status patient, you've paralyzed them, you're not going to see that they're seizing anymore. So making sure that you have your um your medication available if you're going to use ketamine, if you're going to put them on a benzo drip, if you're going to start propofol, having your post sedation medicine available for these patients in particular, that's going to be an anti epileptic medication is super important and critical that we make sure we remember too. So, Sarah, that strategy then of uh, kind of post intubation medication is, is kind of serves a dual purpose, both to help the patient through that intubation. Uh, post intubation period, but also helping them with the management of status epilepticus. And that's one of the reasons we use quite a bit of propofol in the emergency department for post intubation sedation. And it's also got um, anti epileptic uh, properties. So, for some of you who are looking for kind of even more progressive uh, ways of managing uh, these patients, do consider some of these uh, medications that have strictly been used in the operating room or. Uh, the emergency department, such as uh, propofol. So, well, we're on the on the uh, airway um, kind of chatter here. Um, there's a question here that says that considering that intubation did not solve the oxygenation problem, and undoubtedly time was taken for three attempts while on scene, should a less aggressive airway with suctioning and positioning with a more rapid transport to the ED actually been a better course of action for this patient. Phenomenal point of point of discussion when you QI uh, calls like this, you you wonder um, kind of what was happening and what the medics were going and kind of what it came down to was uh, the medics uh, concern that the ongoing uh, low SpO2, high entitle and ongoing bleeding was going to cause a, a problem in route, and that's the reason why why they did it. So let's discuss um, airway strategies, especially in these patients. So Virginia, let's, uh, next slide, and uh, Dr. Shaver is going to handle this one. Okay, so for for endotracheal intubation, having a strategy that you can use every time and rely on every time is super important. Um, a lot of people use like a checklist or some kind of methodical way that they make sure that they're prepared for an intubation so that then they can have a more sex successful intubation. So the first kind of thing we want to talk about is this idea that Dr. Salazar talked about earlier, like a delayed sequence intubation. So kind of moving away from the idea that every intubation needs to be a crash at airway, we need to do it right now, really fast, go, go, go. Um, kind of 
stepping away from that. And if we're, we're in an area that we can oxygenate the patient, we can bag a patient up, we can let them breathe on their own to pre-oxygenate with a nasal cannula and a non-rebreather, really advocating for that aggressive pre-oxygenation, really setting ourselves up for success and the longest safe apnea time, the longest time that they're going to remain oxygenated while they're no longer breathing when we push our paralytic. So kind of what we do in the emergency department is we'll always debrief our team, whether it's you and a, an EMT or paramedic in the field or you're in the emergency department, you wanna debrief everybody, tell them kind of what to expect. What is plan A? When plan A doesn't work, what's plan B and C and D and E? Like what are what is the algorithm we're going to use so that it's not a surprise when, when you have to go to plan B or C. Um, having our adjuncts ready and available, our oral airway, our uh, supraglottic airway, um, the bougie is one of our, our go-to tools that we use, or like we're talking about with the, the video laryngoscope that has a direct blade, so you already have plan B available, kind of preparing the room or the ambulance or the scene where you're at. The next thing is kind of positioning the patient, making sure that you're lining up the anatomy, the ear to sternal notch, making sure you're setting yourself up to be successful for finding the, finding the cords and getting a successful intubation. And with the pre-oxygenation, like we're talking about, it's not only oxygenating the patient, the SpO2 is going to go up, which you want to see and have that high SpO2, but we're also denitrogenating the lungs and really setting the patient up to be able to be, have the longest safe apnea period that we can. Um, using the tools that you have available, if you have video laryngoscope available, we know this has been a game changer for first pass intubation. So using that, but also maybe if you guys have the opportunity to use a direct to make sure you maintain that skill with the blade. Um, having the person that's uh, superior or somebody that has more experience than you as your backup is really important if you have that available so that you can both troubleshoot with them and also learn from them and have that safety net for, and take care of the patient. Um, having um, proper medication, like we're talking about with this delayed sequence intubation. So what you can do is you can give a sedative dose, or uh, not a sedative dose, but you can give a hypnotic dose of the ketamine to kind of allow the patient to calm down a little bit and kind of pre-oxygenate in a better way to really prepare yourself. But this kind of calms the patient down and lets them breathe on their own um, and maintain their, that during pre-oxygenation. Uh, and then end tidal CO2 monitor is super important. It allows you to kind of help confirm where you, your tube is and also maintain how the patient is uh, breathing and ventilating on their uh, after they've been intubated. So kind of having a methodical approach that you go through every time, whether it's a mnemonic or just a checklist of do you have your suction? Is your patient positioned? Are you pre-oxygenating for a long enough amount of time? Do you have your medications ready? And then having your your backup plans and knowing that your team knows the backup plan so they can support you when you do have to proceed to plan B or C. Um, and then your intubation medications. It sounds like from what Virginia saying the ketamine is the go-to choice in the, in the ambulance. So having that available, being ready, and then being ready with your maintenance drugs as well. All lines you up for a smooth endotracheal intubation. Sarah, so it sounds like we're advocating. Oh, go ahead, Virginia. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Shaver, there's that occasional patient that walks up to you. I had one that just walked up to us in the parking lot, um, just struggling to breathe. And as soon as we get him on that SpO2 monitor and kind of start pulling out things, you can see his oxygen declining rapidly. What do you do with that patient? So that's a good question. I think, so that's a that's a great question. And I think preparing that patient for intubation, you know you're going to have to act quickly, but getting some kind of pre-oxygenation is like very important for a successful intubation. So whether if this patient's still breathing on their own, but their SATs are tanking, maybe throwing on a non-rebreather, throwing on a nasal cannula, if they're not breathing on their own or they have a low respiratory rate, maybe bagging for them a little bit and helping them kind of start to get that pre-oxygenation so that when your team is ready to intubate, you, you've you set yourself up in the meantime with a, with a patient that will tolerate the medications that you're gonna give to intubate. So it sounds like we r really wanna, uh oh, hold on. Sorry about that, guys. You gotta just got a warning or something. Uh, it sounds like we are really doing away with the concept of crash airways. Somebody who is deteriorating fairly rapidly with SpO2, we're moving away with the concept of screw this. Let's just go ahead and get the airway, and that's really our only our only choice. And I think that should be of last desperate end of the world kind of 
going to resort because these patients who are not properly pre-oxygenated, they're already hypoxic. Um, the moment you put them in that apneic period and you go ahead and intubate them, those are the patients that quickly start developing cardiac irritability, acidosis, and they develop ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia right in front of your face. So I think, um, Dr. Shaver and Virginia, I think what we're kind of advocating for is kind of moving completely away from RSI as a concept of let's just give the meds, push them, intubate the patient, and rock and roll. And um, what we're advocating instead is kind of this hybrid in which, yes, we're proceeding methodically, we're proceeding intelligently, coordinated, but we don't have that prolonged kind of delayed sequence intubation uh, kind of prolonged algorithm that we use in, in emergency medicine. And perhaps it, it should be somewhere in between. So maybe we'll name it uh, the Shaver Smith uh, protocol at some point, the Shaver Smith uh, sequence intubation, the uh, SSSI, and, uh, and really focus on if the patient is um, hypoxic and irritable, perhaps a little bit altered, they're not tolerating that nasal cannula and that non-breather on top of that. There is room for treating them with some anxiolysis, a little bit of ketamine, some benzos, make their life easier, and also make your pre-oxygenation strategy a lot more, more productive. And then moving on to once you're pre-oxygenated, making sure that you're not happy with the SpO2 the number itself, you're more happy with the sustainability of that SpO2 before you move on to the um, the intubation, making sure that their positioning is more than optimal. We definitely advocate checklist, a two-medic uh, approach to making sure each and every step in the algorithm is taken care of. And I am going to put my name out there saying that VL, video laryngoscopy, should be uh, the way uh, to go. Even for, for services who don't traditionally enjoy a lot of resources, we should definitely be pushing our, our cities, our municipalities to provide, provide us with this, um, with this technology. Um, so to answer the, uh, the question in, in the chat here, um, they wanted to know if uh, we have a patient who has had RSI or DSI, and we've provided uh, non-depolarizing paralytics like brocuronium, vecuronium, they're long-lasting. Do we feel that reversing um, that paralysis after the airway is secured um, make our life e lives easier and for a neurological assessment? And that's a phenomenal question. We, we tend to uh, not uh, reverse paralysis. Um, particularly in the emergency department, uh, there is some room for doing some of that in uh, the intensive care unit. And it, Dr. Shaver, you've you've done a little bit of neuro ICU. Um, is there a, such a strategy for once the patient is upstairs in a more controlled environment for neuro assessments and the patient is intubated? So I haven't seen reversal with Sugamadex for these patients or for any of our neuro patients particularly. I think the if you can get a neuro exam before intubating the patient, it's really helpful. But otherwise, we will typically wait for the paralytic to wear off. I mean, by the time they get up to the neuro ICU or neurologist is at bedside, oftentimes it's it's almost around the same time that the rocuronium is wearing off. So we don't often reverse them um, with Sugamadex for that neuro exam. We used to get yelled at to both in EMS and in the emergency department for paralyzing people. So, wow, you ruined my, my neurological exam. How am I supposed to examine this patient now? Uh, we've, kinda, we've changed the ball game a little bit, and our colleagues and other specialties understand that the patient was paralyzed for a reason. And if that neurological assessment needs to take place at some point, Let's let the paralytic kind of wear off and, and do it slowly and methodically. Um, Paula, if do we have any live live questions uh, so far? We don't have any live questions. We answered no problem the at questions all. that we had in chat. So we just want to thank you everyone for joining. Sorry again that I couldn't launch the second poll. My internet collection, uh, connection was lost right before it was time to launch it. But um, you can still. Uh, earned your free top C accredited CE hours for attending this webinar. So please complete the assessment. We will distribute to you, which will be sent to you your email in about 48 hours. 
Uh, once you complete the assessment, you will automatically report, uh, we will report it in your CE hours to CAPSIF, so you should be good to go. And thank you again, Dr. Salazar, Virginia, Dr. Shaver. Thank you everyone who joined us and just make sure you visit us at careerstore.com for more webinars and free resources to help prepare you improve patient, improve patient outcomes. I'd love thank to thank uh, Dr. Shaver, Sarah, you did phenomenal. Virginia, thank you as always. Um, you're, you're amazing, Paula, thank you so much. We hope uh, that this uh, talk changes your practice in some way. If you have any questions, concerns, on the back end, please feel free to contact us. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be seeing you next month for another offering. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.